the contact fusion cage and ClickX dual core. The posterior approach to the intervertebral disc space requires small implants that fit through the small approach channels, thus avoiding problems with nerves and vessels. Therefore, the contact fusion cage system is used. It consists of two implants sitting side by side in the former disc space. A cage fixed on the inserter will be introduced in a minimum height position in the intervertebral space. Then the cage will be rotated 90 degrees to its maximum height to spread the intervertebral space. The second cage is implanted beside the first using the same procedure. The contact surfaces of the cages are designed for acceptable contact pressure on the intact vertebral cortical end plate. The contact fusion cage is an implant system for posterior lumbar interbody fusion, or PLIF. It was designed to allow for interbody fusion in an optimal anatomical position, to allow distraction of the disc space to be bridged and permit restoration of disc height, lordosis, and widening of the foramen. It was also designed to maintain the integrity of the end plates and to allow for bone growth through the cage. Indications Lumbar and lumbosacral degenerative pathologies indicated for segmental arthrodesis. They include degenerative disc diseases and instabilities. Primary surgery for certain advanced disc diseases or extensive decompression, laminectomy, facetectomy, for aminotomy. Revision surgery for a failed disc operation, recurrence of disc herniation or postoperative instability. Degenerative spondylolisthesis, grades 1 or 2. Isthmic spondylolisthesis, grades 1 or 2. And pseudarthrosis or failed arthrodesis. Contraindications. Severe osteoporosis. Unstable burst fractures and compression fractures. Destructive tumors. Involvement of three or more levels. Spondylolisthesis grades three or four. Acute infections. And extensive peridural scarring. In this exercise, an L4-L5 interbody fusion will be undertaken with contact fusion cages. As with other cages, contact fusion cages are not standalone implants, so they require additional posterior instrumentation. That can be either translaminar screws across the facet joints or alternatively a pedicle screw system. In this exercise, the ClickX system will be used. The implants needed are ClickX pedicle screws with a dual core and double thread. ClickX 3D heads. For demonstration purposes, they're colored purple and can be removed. However, for use in patients, they are gold colored and once applied, cannot be removed. ClickX 6 mm rods. And ClickX locking caps with an inner 3.5 mm hexagonal screw. The instruments used in opening the pedicle are the USS Pedicle Awl, and the USS Pedicle Probe. First, the pedicle screws are inserted in the usual manner. The hole is started with the pedicle awl and completed with the pedicle probe.
The depth of the pedicle is measured, ensuring at the same time that bone surrounds the pedicle hole. A screw of the appropriate length is inserted using the T-handled hexagonal screwdriver and the holding sleeve. As the pedicle screw is inserted, the holding sleeve is released. The screw is not fully inserted. In other words, a few millimeters are left between the screw head and the bone. The reamer for the click X is now placed over the screw head, and the bone is removed. The reamer is angled 25 degrees in all directions. This ensures good clearance of bone to allow the click X 3D head to be attached to the pedicle screw. A similar procedure is undertaken in the other three pedicles. The laminectomy punch and the rongeur are used to prepare the bone and disc space. An appropriate amount of bone is carefully removed from the laminar and facet joints to allow adequate access to the disc space. Enough bone is taken out to ensure that the nerve roots can be retracted without too much tension. Epidural veins are coagulated with bipolar diathermy. The nerve root is retracted medially and the posterior annulus is opened using a sharp scalpel and cutting away from the nerve root. A pituitary rongeur is used to remove the disc. Of course, the anterior annulus is preserved. In a clinical situation, the end plates are then prepared with the square-ended curette. It's important not to remove the end plate, but to remove the cartilage to ensure that the end plate is clean and bleeding. To open the disc space, the disc space opener and the vertebral body spreaders are used. The 14 and 15 millimeter spreaders have been chosen for this exercise. The disc space is opened first with a small disc space opener, which is rotated to enlarge the intervertebral space. The opener is removed, and the smallest vertebral body spreader is inserted until the laser marks on the spreader are flush with the posterior edge of the vertebral body. Then the spreader is turned 90 degrees to spread the disc space, and the handle is removed. Next, the spreader, one size larger, is introduced on the other side. Progressively bigger spreaders continue to be inserted from alternate sides until resistance from the remaining annulus is felt. The disc space has now been enlarged to its natural height. A radiograph should be taken at this stage to ensure the spreaders are in the correct position, which is the midpoint of the vertebral disc space. The contact fusion cage is available in seven sizes. The cage, which corresponds in size to the largest vertebral body spreader, is now connected to the holder. The cage functions as a spacer containing bone graft in order to achieve a bony fusion between the two vertebrae after healing. After removing the smaller spreader, the cage is inserted so that it is at least 3 to 4 millimeters below the posterior portion of the vertebral body. This cage is designed to be rotated 90 degrees. It must go clockwise. If not, it's difficult to turn the implant. If it's necessary to compact the graft, the sleeve is pulled back and the screw is tightened. The sleeve is then loosened and the implant holder removed. The vertebral body spreader is removed from the opposite side and the appropriate size contact fusion cage is inserted, as shown before.
using the positioning holder, the ClickX 3D head is attached. The positioning holder is removed and 3D heads are applied to the remaining three pedicle screws. The appropriate 6mm titanium rods are inserted into the 3D heads. Because this fusion is across one motion segment, the rods do not have to be contoured. The rod pusher, designed specifically for the ClickX and the self-holding cap driver for the ClickX locking cap, are used to insert the locking cap into the 3D head. It is important that the holes in the locking cap are aligned with the tabs of the cap driver. The rod pusher is used to hold the rod in place. The locking cap is then fixed to the 3D head by turning the cap driver until resistance is felt. This procedure is repeated for each 3D head. The rod pusher and the hexagonal screwdriver are used to tighten the 3.5 mm hexagonal screw. At this stage, it's most important to apply axial compression across the cages. The compression should be parallel to the cages. For this reason, a great advantage of the ClickX is that the rod can now be loosened in the ClickX 3D head, while the 3D head remains fixed to the pedicle screw. Applying compression avoids the anterior portion of the vertebral body from opening. The cap driver for the ClickX locking cap and the hexagonal 3.5 mm screwdriver are connected to the screw in L4, and the inner 3.5 mm hexagonal screw is loosened. The rod pusher for the ClickX and the 3.5 mm hexagonal screwdriver are mounted. The compression forceps is placed on the rod and compression is applied across the contact fusion cage. The 3.5 mm hexagonal screw is tightened with the T-handled screwdriver. The procedure is carried out on both sides. This technique promotes excellent compression across the contact fusion cages. The post-operative X-ray shows stabilization of L5-S1 using click X's and contact fusion cages.